Welcome to lesson 13.1, first row D block elements. These are the objectives. So first of all, a transition element is strictly defined as an incomplete D sub level. So what we have here is because these here actually have zinc, cadmium, mercury and copernicum have actually full, completely filled up D shells, they are not considered a transition metal. Similarly, when these things here, they lose an electron, they don't have any D sub levels at all. And so these things, well, this will have a full one and this will have, this one will be gone. That makes them not a transition metal as well. So IB loves to trick you on these things. So I would put that uh, and extremely highlight those as not transition metals, even though they're yellow here and yellow represents a transition metal. Now, why are they transition metals? They're transition metals because the D sub levels look a little bit like this. Now, I know this is a bit scary. Um, but here, here we have a splitting of the sublevels. So what you have here is you have different chemicals that will combine and they'll push on different, they'll push in different directions and come in at different places. And that will cause these, some of the orbitals to get pushed down further and some of them to get pushed out. So the blue I've represented here. So the blue one here, this one's getting pushed by a stronger ligand here. And so the reds are, are pushing out more. And so there's slight shape changes. And when there are these slight, cha slight shape changes, the electrons are free to jump around back and forth in these D sublevel areas. Now, they do this with all sorts of shape changes, but with the D sublevels, it releases that actual distance that it jumps to back and forth when the photon is released. It just releases the wavelength that just so happens to be within the light electromagnetic spectrum. So that is why we can see different colors. It does it with other things as well, but because our eyes can't detect X-rays or radio waves or, electro or other sort of outside the very limited band of light, we can't see what's going on. So it just so happens our eyes can detect this particular jump that happens with the D splitting. It doesn't mean to say that there's not splitting with all the other different sublevels as well as they all change and interact with each other. So the important thing is to use your keywords here, and so make sure you say that the D orbitals split into two different energy sublevels, and the electrons that move between them release photons of electromagnetic light that's of the light spectrum that our eyes can see. Now, uh, very importantly here is the chromium and copper. The chromium here is one, two, three, four, and so if it's going to get a full shell, it just takes this this s electron and fills that up. And so it, it fills up, it only has one S electron and fills up down to a, D, a D5 first. And similarly with copper, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's much more stable to get that one completely full rather than the S one. So it does the same thing and grabs one of those S electrons and pulls it up here. And that way, all of these S's and D's here all are stable with one electron spinning around in one direction rather than a mutual repulsion thing going on in the S and then the D's only filled up with one, only filled up with four instead of a full complete set of five. And just to go to the chromium and the copper, what happens with chromium and copper is instead of having this S go like this, one, two, and then the chromium sort of be half filled, so there's there's five orbitals here, one, two, three, four, five, and this is the second electron. Instead of just having this sort of not completely filled to the five and this mutual repulsion thing going on, an electron pops out of here and goes over to here. And so you have these all with one electron and you have these all completely filled. So what happens with chromium is it just becomes this S1 and not an S2, and this becomes a D5 and not a D4. The same thing happens with copper, as you get these extra electrons, you're gonna get this extra one going down, and so that the D1 will fill, the D2 will fill, the D3 will fill, the D4 will fill, and it does the same thing. It grabs this one and has this whole set nice and filled, and that's more stable. So you need to know that the copper this is an, another exception to add to the previous exceptions that they only have one S electron and they have this um, completely half filled or completely filled uh, D sub levels. So as I mentioned before, the splitting of the D sub levels, the gap between that split when the electrons move up and down, the photons release light of the of uh, in the electromagnetic light area of the spectrum, so we can see. Uh, and so 
what else what else do they do well because they have variable oxidation numbers we're going to talk about next because they can change their ability to take an electron and let go of an electron it makes them very good to create situations that cause catalysts and I'll talk about catalysts um, later and I'll, I'll use a demonstration where I'm using my hand so that the ability of, of to grab onto a molecule and allow it to be in a certain place in a certain shape helps a reaction to occur just like your hands can grab these metal shapes and they put them in such a position that allows a reaction to occur that would not normally occur so these things have because they have these variable splitting they have this ability to grab things and put them in in situations that would not normally occur um, I've got a demonstration here showing you diamagnetic substances that's repelled by a magnetic and paramagnetic substances that can't be made into a magnet but are attracted to a magnet because they have electrons uh, that are locked into one area. So what you'd expect of most materials, and you can see that here, is that a magnetic field is attracted to domains which have all electrons spinning in one direction. But what we have here is a piece of pyrolytic carbon that I got off eBay. And what it has is the it's graphite, but it's incompletely formed. And so the electrons are stuck and they're trapped in one direction. And so when a magnet here, which is a rare earth magnet, that's very strong, it's going to not accept the fact that it can't alter the, the way the electrons spin and they're trapped in one section and so they repel. And so what you can see is it floats. So it's the world's most diamagnetic substance because the electrons won't shift and they're stuck in a position that is contrary to what the magnetic field wants them to be in. Paramagnetism, on the other hand, is the electrons that have different places where they can move into a set state but they don't stay in that state and so what I've done one of the a good paramagnetic substances copper sulfate so I've made a copper sulfate crystal and you can see if you put it on a very low friction device such as hanging from a thread or you could float around on some polystyrene and you put a strong rare earth magnet to it you can see that it actually turns and it's actually attracted to the magnet and that's called paramagnetism. All right, uh, just to mention too that transition metals, uh, they can all form plus two because they lose that 4s electrons and you don't need to know what the, the transition metal electron ion states are because it's here now. It used to be have to be memorized in the old syllabus, believe it or not. And so you've got it now in your data booklet. You can look it up and see what common oxidation states they, ha they occur in. So an explanation of why are these things in such variable oxidation states is because of convergence and these overlapping shells. And there's very little difference with them once they get out really further away. So have a look at something that's a lot smaller, like a sodium atom. Uh, you take away the first electron, it's quite easy, 400, relatively speaking, 500. Uh, but then you get to a noble gas and then it jumps tenfold and it's 4,000. And within a few, it's up to over 10,000. And so what you can see here is it's, it's very difficult to remove the successive electrons. Uh, if you go to manganese or copper, some transition metals, you can see here that the difference between these, because these shells are all converging and they're very similar and overlapping, there's only a, a double difference, not a, not a by 10 difference. Uh, this is a double difference again, that's less than a double, less than a double less than a double and we're getting starting to get over 10,000 now uh, and that's a lot more and a lot less difference. Here we have with copper again well this is like a triple difference less than a half less than a half less than a half and it takes a lot longer for it to get over 10,000 and there aren't massive differences that are going on and so that's why it is much easier for them to have uh, different oxidation states and you'll see here it's quite common to have copper plus one and plus two and that's 3,500 here. That's a, a almost a double jump there. Manganese, look, these, these numbers are really, really tiny and we're gonna do a lab where we're gonna get a lot of these ones and see different colors. Okay, so this is the electron orbital diagrams of some, of some state here. And you can see here that the chromium exceptions here, you can see that that's a stable formation. Uh, rather than having like empty shells and then mutual repulsion shells, they do this. And same with copper you can see that it is, uh, it's a more stable configuration, it's more balanced.
Okay, so that's how you do the electron orbital diagrams for the transition metals. Moving on to complex ions now, there's a lot of terminology going on here. So the complex ion consists of a central transition metal ion and a ligand. Okay, and the coordination number indicates how many dative coordinate bonds are going on here. Now a dative coordinate bond is when there's just a lone pair electron attracted to a positive but there's technically not a bond, it's technically an intermolecular force. Now the coordination number indicates how many ions are attracted to the central ion. So here the coordination number is 2 and this one is 4 and this one's 6 and this one's 4 as well. So how many ligands are attached is the coordination number. Okay, so let's dissect the whole thing here. If you have this here, you look for the central atom and that'll be the positive one. And then you go to these ions here. Now if you know that this forms an ion, that's great. So you know that's a negative charge there. Uh, and this ammonium here, it may or may not be a negative ion. It may just have a uh, lone pair of electrons that are causing the attraction and not a straight out anion. And so what you've got here is six different ligands and so that would make a coordination number of six. And so the whole thing is a complex ion and that's, that's contained within square brackets. The whole thing is called a coordination compound because it can still have uh, a charge on it and you can still have free ions joining on the outside. So that's that's really quite a mess I know. So here we have the number of lone pairs bound to the central ion and here we have the octahedral shape. So if the coordination is 6 we call that an octahedron. Uh, if the coordination is 4 it can either be a tetrahedral shape or a square planar. So you're going to have to memorize these shapes and the names of these things and it'll come up in unit 4. And if it's just got 2 it's linear. You're just going to have to learn this. I'll try and explain uh, orbital shells uh, in the next lesson but if there is a d8 configuration uh, and so that's not a full d10 and it's a strong ligand then so this d8 configuration most commonly is copper that's when you get the square planar otherwise everything else is tetrahedral now it makes sense for it to be tetrahedral uh, because this is what the d orbitals look like and what you'll see, there should be two here because this will be the, the big D one with the, the donut in the shape. If you look at this thing, uh, and this is about where the electron shapes are, the easiest places to go in are here and here and here. So there's one, two, three, four here and one, two, three, four here. So if you've got, so if you've got four ligands, uh, the easiest shape, it's not going to form like this. They're going to repel each other. Uh, and so they're not going to join like that either because that's too close to each other so they're going to go opposite like that and I don't know if you can recognize that but joining in like that in these most open spaces here is actually a tetrahedral shape. Uh, these ones aren't as clear I'm afraid because they're not perfectly shaped where I've made this out of molded plastic so I've pretty much got the angles perfectly correct and so you can see that there's this big four big spaces here and four big spaces under here when you do the angles correctly. Okay, just to go here, monodentite ligands have one type of ligand and so that would be monodentate, these ones here, and this would be a polydentate because there's two types. Now this is a coordination of six because there's six here and there's three plus three, that makes six. There's four here and there's two here. So that would be linear uh, and that would be octahedral and this is the nasty one where it's either tetra it's you just always go tetrahedral all right but as we said before if it's a d8 uh, and then it if the central metal lines are d8 and here we have the d8 so it's one two three four five six seven eight so if it's nickel palladium platinum or the ds have i pronounced that word there then you're going to go for square planar. Now unfortunately there's an exception and that's copper. And so the rule is uh, it's tetrahedral with copper um, but if the ligand is strong it's a square planar. So let's look at the strength of the ligand in your data booklet. You've got ammonium and chloride and this is out of your data booklet. Now what's a strong ligand and what's a weak ligand? 
I'm not quite sure. I'll just do an imaginary dotted line here. Chlorine's more on this side, ammonium's more on this side, so this will go for strong and this will go for weak. And so what did we say here? This one was strong and this one was weak. So for this one here it's tetrahedral and for this one here it's square planar. Now that's pretty nasty, uh, but that's what it is. Okay, uh, and so there are some rules there to help you learn what they are. That's about as nasty as you can get. Okay, more on the definition of what a ligand is. A ligand has, it's either an anion or it's just a neutral molecule, but it has must have a non-bonding non pair of electrons to form a dative coordinate bond, and normally we signify that like that. And so you'd have the metal complex ion in here, and you'd have your ligand here with your free pair of electrons attracted to it. Okay, and so why do transition metals form? They form because they're relatively small ions, and so they can fit these ligands in here. So you can see here with the transition metals, they are relatively small. They seem to form this small little block here. Uh, these shells are quite large, and these are going not going to be, and you can see here they're getting quite large again. These are going not going to be positive, going to be negative. Okay, here's an example of one. So you can see here I've drawn these arrows here to represent a coordinate bond rather than just a line. Square box always for ions and a 3 plus charge. So the whole thing's overall got a 3 plus, so it must be Fe3 plus. And finally, EDTA, ethylene diamine tetracetic acid. This one's really quite important for heavy metal poisoning. We'll get into that uh, a little later as well, into, into further topics. Um, so it's a polydentate line because ion because each of these things is is different on one molecule and it, it will attract 